with more than conquerors. Let's say it together. We are more than conquerors. In other words, we're not going to make it by the skin of our teeth. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. We're, not, we're not just barely getting by, folks. Ain't good news. Yes. <clears throat> you know, several thoughts ran through my head as Jimmy was singing that song. Beautiful song. Because of, of God's love, we're covered by the blood. His blood has made all the difference. And sometimes, you know, sometimes I, I'm guilty of this. I'm just going to make a confession tonight. Sometimes I, on purpose, paint the world and the world conditions and our culture in a very dark light. Because I think it's true. What I hope to do and what I fail to do sometimes is to help us to understand it doesn't matter how dark it gets. We are the children of God. And our God, the God we serve, the God we trust, is in charge. And it's going to be okay. Because he's sovereign. And so, uh, <laughs> even though sometimes, sometimes we wake up and we think these are the worst days of our life. And the truth of the matter is these are really the best days of my life. Because I'm one day closer to my home. But I'm not going to waste my time while I'm here. In King James, Jesus told his servants, occupy. Occupy till I come. That's, that's what I was preaching about this morning. I want us to occupy. I want us to be busy. I want us to, to get out of this church and out in the community and make a difference where we live. Occupy. That doesn't mean sit. It means work. Amen? And sometimes, I, like I say, sometimes I fail to, 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 to contrast that darkness with, I know, I mean, it's ugly, it's horrible. The sin of this world is deplorable, it's detestable. But our God is pure. And our God is calling us to holiness. And he's calling us to purity. And, uh, and, and his righteousness. And we can stand in that righteousness. And make a difference in this world. So I just, as, I, as she was singing that song, just those thoughts came to me. Well, let's get back to 2 Kings, the 7th chapter. Quite an incredible story, I think. I love, I love the stories that are found in the Old Testament. They are... They're, they're not what you would expect them to be, they, unless you already know them. Of course, we've read them many times. But you just you just sit in amazement. You just wonder uh, about this city of Samaria that is surrounded and, and, uh, and not being able to go in, not being able to come out. They're starving to death. The leper colony is on the outside. And, and Samaria has been encompassed around about by the Arabian army and and, and there they said, what are they going to do? Now everything is going to end. Life is going to end as we know it. Until God steps in. Until God steps in. It, until God steps into your situation. Until God steps into your world, into your problem, into your circumstances. You may not have much hope. But God's going to step in. Because God's got this, right? Right. Okay, I know you're a little lethargic. I preached about that this morning. But you have every reason to be lethargic because most of you did not get your Nazarene name. I can tell because a lot of you are drunk. I never get a Nazarene name. But I want to share just real quickly this afternoon uh, this story. And I intended it to be a short message. So don't, don't think I've gone easy on you this week. And even though I did take those five pregnancies on this morning. There, there. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of coming in for landing. So, anyway, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about why do we not listen to the Lord? Well, I mean, really, why do we not trust His promises? Think about that. I mean, I, put, put it in its historical context in this story. 
God, how many times has God told the children of Israel that he'll protect them? He'll take care of them. All he asks is for them to be obedient. That's all he asks of you. All he asks is for you to do what he asks you to do. To love his commandments. And why do we not believe that God's going to do what he promises he will do? And so here they are. Samaritans are, are, are just jam-packed. They have no way of, no way of getting food. They're, 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 they're just there, and they're going to die. And they really did not even think that uh, God would deliver. So what I want to do tonight is I want to talk to you. When God moves, certain things will happen. The first is this. When God moves in our hearts and in our lives, he will bring conviction when we're doing wrong. Truth be known, we don't like it. No more than a child likes to be corrected by a parent. But when God begins to move, when God begins to answer questions, he will make us feel conviction for the things that we've done wrong. It's here in this eighth verse. And I read it to you this morning. Remember, some of you were here this morning. I would go back and read the whole story, but I don't think I'm going to take the time. When these lepers, verse 8, came to the outskirts of the camp, remember, they, they, they decide they're going to step up and step out. They, they, they decide that, that, that it, you know, we could sit here and die. If we go out there, we might die. But at least if we go out there, we're trying. We're stepping up and we're stepping out. And so when they came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered in one tent and ate and drank and carried from there silver and gold and clothes and went and hid them. And they returned and entered into another tent and carried from there and also and went and hid them. Because when they got to the camp, they found out that the Arameans had been ran off by God. He made there to be a sound of chariots and horses, and, and they just knew that, that the children of Israel had hired the Hittites to come and just storm them. And so they fled, and they fled in haste because they were afraid. It's an amazing thing when God's children begin to start stepping up and stepping out, the enemy gets scared. The devil's scared of you. A scared. <laughs> I want to tell you, when I lived in Indiana, I never said a scared. <laughs> and here I am. The devil, he, he fears you when you are obedient to God. You are, you're, 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 you're a force when you're in the hand of God and you're obeying God. And so in this passage of scripture, what happens is the enemy is gone, and they go into one tent, and they basically take all the stuff. And then they go and hide. They go into another tent. They take all the stuff, and they go and hide. Verse 9. And they said to one another, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news. But we're keeping silent. If we wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore, come. Let us go tell the king's household. You see what happened? All of a sudden they begin to have a conscience. All of a sudden they begin to realize, hey, wait a minute. This, this, this is like, how many of you have ever heard that there's already a cure for cancer and they just want to keep it because there's too much money in cancer treatment? Anybody ever heard that? Anybody? Raise your hand if you've heard that. Okay. Well, why wouldn't you raise your hand? <laughs> of course you've heard that. I don't know. I, you know, I remember years ago, back when we used to have the big, like, four barrel and carburetors and everything, and those gas guns, I remember they used to, they came out. I remember we used to read uh, popular mechanics. And they said that there was a guy who had invented this carburetor and you could get like 60 miles to the gallon, you know, with those big old gas guns. But, but the automobile industry wouldn't let that patent be put in force because it could cut down on all the 
here and all the gas companies will lose money. Anybody believe that? <laughs> yeah, I heard that too. Yeah, their own carburetors on them to save too much money if they bought the car. I heard that. Okay, my point is this they invented the, the cure for cancer. But it will keep it insane. Because we're making too much money. I really don't want to believe that. But isn't that what we do in church? Every person you come in contact with this week is out of the ark of Satan. They need to get you done. They need the good news that we hear, that we know, that we've read, that we've experienced. Every person we know needs what we've got. And we keep it to ourselves. That's exactly what these men were doing. They're going into the camp. Hey, this is great. We get all this stuff. We're going to go and hide. Nobody will know. But all of a sudden, something began to happen. It's a neat thing. We call it revival. When God begins to move, God begins to answer prayer. We come under the conviction of the things that you're doing wrong. Amen. Yeah. Now, let's move on. Second thing, when God begins to move, there are always going to be those that doubt. It's the second. There will be those that doubt. Let's look at verse 10. So they came and called to the gatekeepers of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of Aramea, and behold, there was no one there. That's kind of a Really? There's no one there. Nor the voice of a man, only the horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents just as they were. The gatekeepers called and told it within the king's household. Look at verse 12. Then the king arose in the night and said to his servants, I will now tell you what the Arameans have done. They know that we're hungry. Therefore, they have gone from the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying that when they come out from the city, we shall capture them alive and get into the city. Remember what I said last Sunday night when I talked about Rhoda? We pray, and we pray, and we pray, and we believe. Do you believe when you pray? Do you believe that God's going to give you what you ask for? But then all of a sudden, when God answers prayer, we have to doubt. This was the king. The king has received promise after promise after promise from God. But all of a sudden, he begins to doubt the goodness of God. Sounds like some Nazarene time. We begin to doubt the goodness of God. We begin to doubt that God will do what he said he would do. And when God begins to move, sometimes doubts arise. Hang with me. This is pretty crucial. This is, this is a crucial part of the message. You see, the proof's in the pudding. Who the real faithful are. And we have to be careful that we're not one of those that doubt that what God said He would do, He does. There will be those that doubt. Third thing, that is, I'm halfway through. Isn't that deep? Third thing is this. When God begins to move, He wants to let us see. He wants us to prove. He wants us to diagnose. He wants us to analyze. He wants us to see things for the way they really are. Look at verse 13. One of His servants answered and said, Please, 
let some men take five of the horses which remain. See, a lot of them died. The five horses of which remain, which are left in the city, behold, they will be in any case like all the multitude of Israel who are left in it. Behold, they will be in any case like all the multitude of Israel who have already perished. So let us send and see. And they took therefore two chariots with horses and the king sent after them in the army of the Arameans, saying, Go and see. And they went after them to the Jordan, and behold, all the way was full of clothes and equipment which the Arameans had thrown away in their haste. Then the messengers returned and told the king. Verse 16. So the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. Then a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. So let us see. In other words, let us see if God keeps his promises. And so they took the five horses, and they took the chariots, and they went outside of the city, and they went as far as the Jordan. And as far as they were going, Ricky, the Arabians were saying, they're after us, they're after us, they're throwing their clothes off and they're running, and, and all this stuff is strewn all over the fields. Because they were scared to death they were about to be ran over by the Hittites. And the Hittites were a lot of miles away. That's what God can do. That's what God can do. See, God can do the impossible. God's got this. If, if we just don't care how God's got this, and if we don't spend our time trying to tell how God to have this, and if we just trust that God's got this, God's got this. And he wants us to come and see. He wants us to see the magnificence of his power. He wants to see the faithfulness of his promises. He wants us to see that. It's important that we see that. It's important. This is the reason I preached the way I did to our young people this morning. I want our kids to see a miracle working God. It's important that, that these little kids grow up understanding that God answers prayer. He says, come and see. It's exactly what Jesus told the disciples. When he was asking, oh, you don't have any place to lay your head. You know, he said, come and see. He just basically said, come and watch me. Come be a part of what I'm doing. And see if I'm not going to do what I said I would do. See if I'm not the Messiah. God says, come and see. Watch. Behold. Take note of. And then he says, go tell. Amen? Amen. I'm about to preach myself in the lab. It's just a little simple outline. So let's look at the last one. This is what I want you to understand. Rewards will be fair and balanced. God's fair. God's honest. God will take care of people. Now, I don't know what God had against this gatekeeper. I don't know what the gatekeeper had done. You remember the early part of the story? Remember Elijah said, you know what, well, yeah, tomorrow everything's going to be dirt cheap, but you're not going to eat it. Well, why? I don't know. I, that's a part of the story. I don't know anything about it. But this is what I do. This is what I find out when I read this passage of Scripture. Now, the king appointed a royal officer in whose hand he leaned to have, uh, to, to, to have charge of the gate. But the people trampled on him in the gate. And he died just as, in other words, Elijah had said, who spoke when the king came down to him. It came about just as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall be sold tomorrow about this time at the gate of Samaria. I, was it his unbelief? I don't know. Then the royal officer answered the man of God and said, Now behold, remember, he's kind of getting smarmy, you know, he's kind of snarky. A little bit smart alecky, kind of, you know, that's what he meant to be. Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he said, Behold, 
You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be that gay. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be smart elegy with God. I don't know what he did, but whatever he did, I don't want to do. But he goes on. And it happened, or it so happened, to him for the people trampled on him at the gate. And he died. And so what Elijah said was true. Now what I will tell you about that is this. Is that God has your needs all taken care of. Trust his promises, for God will reward you for your faithfulness. It may not show up in a new cabinet. It may not show up as the biggest house on the block. It may not show up with a raise when you really deserve it. God will reward you. And your faith. He always had and he always will. Because God is in the promise keeping business. And the thing I love about the Old Testament is I just think to myself, and I don't know if all Jews are this way. Please don't take this the wrong way. I don't know if all Hebrew descendants are this way, but boy, they're thick headed people. I mean, I mean, how many times does it take? as many as it takes for some of us to What a story. It's news too good to be true, but it's true. Our God keeps his promises. Our God takes care of his children. Our God, he's got this. No matter where it is. Amen? Amen. Don't don't hold me to preaching this short ever again. <laughs> it ain't never happened. Let's see. We'd like to invite all of you in. We have prayer breakfast tomorrow morning. Come if you'd like to at 5 30. We'd love to have you. We start at 6. Everybody's welcome. Love for you to be there. Women, not well. <laughs> I've always been afraid that one of these days some of the women are going to say, well, we're not going And then I think, no, nah, they're going to sleep again. <laughs> Forget it. But it's, 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 it's a wonderful, wonderful time. I, mean, I, I just enjoy it. Now, probably over 25 years old. 25, very few things happen for 25 years old. But this prayer breakfast has been meaningful for a lot of men over the years, many of whom have now gone on to be with Jesus. Just remember, tomorrow morning, 5.30, they'll probably be having their prayer breakfast to heaven, too. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you, Lord, for the good news that you keep your promises. Now, Father, help us to walk out of this place tonight and into our week this week. And help us to live like you keep your promises. And Father, help us to realize the news that we've had. The news that has changed and transformed our lives. Is as good for every person we've come in contact with this week. And I pray, Lord, you would use us in a powerful way to touch the hearts and lives of folks this week. Bless these, my people, in every way that they need you most. Bring blessings into their life. And may they flourish and may they prosper. And Lord, may they bring glory and honor to your name. All that they say in We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Those of you that are staying, have a good time. Enjoy yourself.